Let us pray. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction, and touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. And we thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice and for love and for peace. And so we here echo the prayer of Pope Francis as we begin this presidential conference on the integrity of creation. We ask God's blessing on our presenters and particip participants, both here at Duquesne University of the Holy Spirit and around the world. And as always, we pray through, through the Spirit who gives life. Amen. Thank you, Father French, and a very special welcome to the Spiritans around the world who are streaming uh, our, our conference through their various communities. My name is Professor McGill, and I am the chair of the conference planning committee, and uh, it's now my privilege to introduce President Ken Gormley to give a welcome to you all. Thank you very much, Jerry, and welcome, everyone. My name is Ken Gormley, and I have the privilege of serving as the 13th president of Duquesne University of the Holy Spirit. And it is so wonderful to have all of you participating in Duquesne's annual Integrity of Creation Conference, which is truly a world-changing scholarly initiative, now in its seventh year. It's hard to believe. Uh, it's especially wonderful to see so many of you here on campus uh, after we have faced so many disruptions uh, over the past two years due to the pandemic. We're thrilled that many of you here tonight will also be with us uh, in a couple of days to celebrate 150 years of spirit and mission and service in the United States at a very special gala this Wednesday evening. Uh, and it's great to see so many of our own Duquesne community here for this important conference. A special welcome to those of you uh, visiting our beautiful campus from all over the country and the world, including uh, many folks across the globe, as Jerry said, who are live streaming uh, this conference as we speak. A very special welcome tonight to Father Don McCacken, sitting back at the table here, uh, Provincial Superior for the United States, and also to Father Jeff Duane, also at that uh, imp table of important people right there. Uh, Father Jeff is the former U.S. Provincial who is now the newly elected General Assistant for the Spiritan Congregation, serving in this important role in Rome. Um, he he hadn't had enough of Pittsburgh weather, so he came back here before he goes back to Rome. Uh, but we're proud to count both Father McCacken and Father Duane among our university's most esteemed alumni. Uh, and I'd like to extend as well a special welcome to today's plenary speaker, Megan Chapel, Vice President of Sustainability at Georgetown University. We're so happy to have you here with us this evening. Uh, Megan grew up part of her life in Cleveland. We do not hold that against her in the Cleveland environs. Uh, she said that she's truly a Steelers fan. Uh, but we also welcome our very own Dr. Jennifer Bates. Uh, we're so uh, happy to have Jennifer here. Hello, Jennifer. Um, Duquesne University professor of philosophy 
who will address this gathering tomorrow. And of course, as always, our thanks to Dr. Jerry McGill and his entire team for organizing this important gathering here at Duquesne. And I think before we go any further, we better have a round of applause for Jerry and his team for putting this <laughs> wonderful event together. As, as educators at Duquesne University of the Holy Spirit, we strive to prepare young men and women not only to succeed in their chosen careers, which is essential, but also to make a positive difference in the lives of others. And in fulfilling this mission, we join with other universities around the globe in setting a course for the next generation of leaders, the change makers of tomorrow, who will guide our planet's future. And of course, as you all know more than most, that future begins now, and it begins through learning and dialogue such as that which will be taking place throughout this conference. So this evening, Megan Ch Chapel will discuss the vital role of inclusion in any efforts surrounding sustainability and resilience. And it is an extremely important topic because environmental sustainability is best achieved within an inclusive society that is dedicated to improving the quality of life for all individuals, truly the spirit and way. As Pope Francis implores us, we can only take our efforts to the next level if we truly do so together. He writes, we need a conversation which includes everyone since the environmental challenges we are undergoing and their human roots concern and affect us all. Uh, so may you learn and grow together these next few days through the remarks of our keynote speakers and through thoughtful conversation in your workshops and sessions. Thank you for the important work that you're doing here and in your home communities. Uh, may you be enlightened and encouraged as you learn together at this conference. And may you be strengthened in your resolve to help protect our planet and each other guided as we always are, and as Father Ray just said in his beautiful blessing, by the spirit who gives life. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Gormley. Uh, and let me add that the, the important word about this conference is that it's a scholarly conference. It's an academic conference. It's for you to share your insights, not only having the speakers give us their wisdom, but you engaging the speakers too. And tomorrow we have our workshops. And by the way, over here on the left-hand side are the published proceedings that we do after every conference. So have a look at those on your way out to let you see how significant the academic aspect of our conference is. So we're now about to have the evening take off and we're going to invite uh, Darlene Weaver, who is uh, a professor and the associate provost in our university, who will introduce our speaker, Megan Chapel. Thanks, Darlene. Good evening. I'm so pleased to tell you a bit about Megan Chapel. She is Georgetown University's inaugural Vice President for Sustainability. In that role, she leads a variety of operational, academic, and policy areas in order strategically to position Georgetown as a prominent contributor on sustainability at both national and global scales. She brings expertise in innovation, entrepreneurship, renewable energy, urban farming, biodiversity, inclusive sustainability, environmental justice, circularity, and green buildings. She has worked as a change agent for sustainability in the corporate and nonprofit sectors. In an interview when she joined Georgetown, Vice President Chapel stated, interdisciplinarity and systems thinking are the signature of my background. She has worked on issues from human rights and social justice 
to green buildings, clean transportation, urban architecture, responsible textiles and fashion, climate resilience, health access, fresh water, and biodiversity. She describes her work as applying a lens of justice and equity in order to strive to include a diversity of voices in conversation and implementation around issues of sustainability. Vice President Chapel's experience includes leading her neighboring institution, George Washington University, through its comprehensive sustainability strategy process and establishing GW's reputation as a leader in sustainability. Her experience includes advising F50 corporations at sustainability and Odwaga, managing the global business education network at World Resources Institute, leading youth education for the Nature Conservancy on the south side of Chicago, serving in AmeriCorps with Public Allies Chicago, and supporting many social innovation and sustainable enterprises. Vice President Chapel's credentials include an MBA in corporate strategy, an MS in environmental policy from the University of Michigan, and a BA in environmental science from Northwestern University. Vice President Chapel's address is titled, Future of Sustainability and Resilience in Higher Education Depends on Inclusivity. Please join me in welcoming Megan Chapel. Good evening, there we go. I have to warm up my computer so you can warm up your voice as well. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure and thank you so much for the warm welcome. I am feeling right at home here. I have not been to Duquesne before, um, but it is just, you all are emanating this energy that is really delightful and welcoming and I, I can just sense it. So I appreciate the invitation to be here and to speak with you tonight. So let's get started, if I can, there we go. Um, I, I wanted to use this time today to focus on how we face climate change collaboratively and how we take action together. It is my hope that our conversation tonight will support the spirit and mission that you all share here at Duquesne and that you celebrate at this Integrity of Creation Conference. I am coming from Washington, D.C. as a third-generation immigrant family from Eastern and Western Europe to the United States. I grew up on the Great Lakes, just down the street, as part of a large Catholic family. And um, I'm in a newly created role, as, as Darlene mentioned. And I bring to this role experience in my career really focusing on systems and systems change. That long list of things that she made, I'm not an expert in any of them. I just have experience in all of them. I consider myself really an expert on this system and how these things are interconnected and how we are interconnected. But I have worked in lots of different sectors, the corporate sector, local community development, the NGO sector and higher ed. And I've learned in all of these places that experience, from my experience, I've learned that including people who impact and who are impacted by the decisions is at the core of making sustainability change. I am having a hard time. Uh-oh, I need my tech guy. The cursor. Let me see if I can get this back. There we go. Oh, I don't need my tech guy. I'm good, Mike. Thanks. All right. And all of you here today, are you have a specific role to play. Some of you are change makers now. Some of you are going to be change makers in the future. Some of you are educators and researchers and ministers of spirit and faith. We are all here to create a sustainable university and a sustainable world. And I commend you for being here and for taking this time, whether you're online and joining us virtually or you're here in person, to really commit yourself to understanding the concept of climate change, the challenges that we face, and to commit yourself to figuring out how you can be part of the future in a good way. So before we go any further, I want to plant a question with you. I'm planting the seed with you. What is the most impactful moment you have experienced making change in the world? My talk might get a little boring, so your homework when you start to get bored is to go back to this question and think for yourself. What is the most impactful moment that you have experienced making change in the world? 
This is the core question of my talk tonight. And we are going to come back to it. So I want you to think about this question for yourself and perhaps be prepared to provide an answer by the end. And I'm also going to be referencing my own personal response to this question throughout the talk. All right. Let's start with a quiz. I'll take any answers from the audience. You can just shout it out. We're going to talk about consumption. So the richest 1% of the global population emits how much more carbon emissions than the poorest 50%? Let's think about in terms of times. Like one time, two times, three times, 20 times, 50 times. Any ideas? Just a sense of scale. The richest 1% of the global population emits how much more carbon emissions than the poorest 50%? Two times more. It was good. I kind of led you to go too far, didn't I? But it's two times. So 1% has two times as much as 50%. There's something a little off about that. Let's talk about biodiversity. Extinction rates are tens to hundreds of times higher than they have been in the past how many years? 100. 10 million. So over the last 10 million years, our extinction rates are higher than they've been. That puts things in perspective, right? All right, let's look on the upside. Personal will. What percentage of global consumers are willing to change purchasing habits to help reduce environmental impact? How much faith do you have in your fellow humans? I heard 30, 45. Let's keep this in mind. All right, disparities. In the United States, black and African Americans and Latinos are how much more likely to work or live in areas with proje highest projected increases in climate-related joblessness, illness, and death? 30 to 50%. Inclusivity. This is my favorite fact of everything in this entire presentation. When women participate equally with men, are climate policy interventions more effective, less effective, or the same? More effective. And there's research that shows this. This is from a book, All We Can Save. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And our time window. We need to reduce climate emissions. I'm sure many of you know the answer to this. By 45% by what year to stay below the 1.5 degrees Celsius that keeps us from some of the absolute worst outcomes of climate change? What year do we have to fix some of these problems? 2015. It's 20. 2030. So we have, a, we have a little bit of time here, people, but that's why we're here tonight, because we don't have a whole lot of time. And we need to um, figure this out. So the point is here that these are some truths about sustainable development. We are facing some daunting challenges, um, and yet we still have many choices on how we're going to face these challenges. What I'd like to talk to you about this evening is, um, there we go. Sorry, I'm just catching up my slides here. What I'd like to talk to you about this evening is my personal approach to making change. So this work, as President Gormley said, of creating a healthy and thriving relationship with the earth for all of us, this for all piece is really referring to all of us on this planet, no matter where we live, how much money we make, what color our skin is, what religion we have, or what generation we live in. And I truly believe that the future of sustainability and resilience here in higher education depends on inclusivity. This is based on my experience. So I've tried tonight to distill my personal learnings into a few slides to share with you. You might refer to them or use them, or they might just inspire you. You might forget everything I said, but you might remember how you felt when I talked to you about this, and that's what's most important. I want to share with you my framework and my stories on how me, as one change agent, has approached this work of creating a more sustainable and equitable world with both institutions, like a university, and with individuals, like myself. So making change to create a better world is perhaps um, the most spiritually human path, in my opinion. In my experience, it requires truth, courage, and love. So we're going to talk about each of those things.
truth. I don't know if you know Bell Hooks, but she was an amazing author and thought leader. And she said in her book, All About Love, New Visions, that the heart of justice is truth-telling, seeing ourselves and the world the way it is rather than the way we want it to be. More than ever before, we as a society need to renew a commitment to truth-telling. We need to take a look at ourselves, each of us personally, and we need to take a look at the larger system that we are a part of and that we are, have constructed as part of the human race. And Chico Mendez, he says that environmentalism without class struggle is just gardening. And that's a really important thing to take into account because when we focus on the truth, we need to be inclusive of not just one perspective or our own perspective. We need to be sure that we are including multiple perspectives, polarized perspectives, marginalized perspectives, and everything in between. So remember that question I asked you earlier? Well, I'm gonna answer it for myself. One of the most impactful moments I had experiencing making change in the world. This is the story of Sister Pat and the Beans Talk. So I was, um, I grew up in Lorain, Ohio, and, and I grew up climbing these piles of iron ore pellets. This is on the Black River. Um, when I was in my first year at Lorain Catholic High School, my religion class was on social justice, and my teacher was Sister Pat. She used a very simple interactive technique to teach us about resource distribution. We had a cup of dried beans on our desk, each of us, and um, she told us that the cup represented natural resources in the world. She instructed us to create two piles, one for a lower income country and another for a higher income country, indicative of the United States. So we placed 10 beans equally in each pile. She then had us rearrange the beans to show consumption patterns, placing 18 beans on the higher income country and two beans on the lower income country. This question of what was the most impactful memory, or the impactful moment, when I reflect on this, I have a physical feeling, a physical sensation of feeling hot and flush, and then I realize the emotions that come with that, I feel ashamed and I feel angry. At that time, I learned about myself that I had incredible, an incredible amount of privilege, and that I had been taking it for granted, and I was completely ignorant of that privilege. At that time, during that experience, I learned about the world outside of myself, that the consumption of high-income countries relies on materials and resources from other countries, and that the distribution of those resources was inequitable and even unjust. And for that, we needed more inclusive systems. That's what I remember learning. After that exercise, Sister Pat told us ninth graders that we had the knowledge and information now to set things the way we saw right to be right. So this still affects my work today because I have clarity on the truth of the global distribution of wealth and I feel empowered by Sister Pat's gentle approach, her simple lesson, and her confident encouragement to use the truth to make change. When we face the truth, we can choose to see that we are part of a system. The good news is that we are all interconnected and we can work in community for change in the system together. So the more inclusive we are, the more we can make change together. All right, the second thing that I believe to be the most um, important requirement for making change, hold on a second, is around, um, is around courage. This is one of my favorite photos. Um, this is a big wave surfer. She's Brazilian, Maya Gabera. That is a huge wave behind her and she has courage. And so this picture always inspires me. And when I mean courage for making change, I believe that we need to have courage to face the truth, including our own internal shortcomings and our personal contributions to the larger inequitable power dynamics and transgressions that we have in our larger system. I believe we need to have the courage to counter this by choosing to be inclusive in our approach to creating a better world. And this is a quote from Peter Senge. If you've used him in your systems thinking classes or your organizational change classes, it's not what the vision is, it's what the vision does. 
I believe we need to have the courage to envision the future we want and the present that we want and to do this envisioning collectively. Why is visioning courageous? Because sometimes for those of us facing the truth of global trends, it's daunting and even may feel pointless at times. But visioning a sustainable future and a sustainable present is essential to build up our momentum together. Adrian Marie Brown says, what we focus on grows. Another wonderful book, Emergent Strategies. If we collectively create this vision with courage, we can focus on what works and the desired outcome. If what we focus on grows, the more we think of something, the more it becomes our reality. I used this technique deliberately with you in the question I asked you at the beginning. What is one of the most impactful moments you had making change? And the reason I asked you that question is because I want you to think about the times and the places that it felt right. And I want you to bring those right feelings and what made that right into your current work. So you can draw on this question in the future to make change. And doing it together with all parties affected by the change this can make a big difference in terms of trust. So Stephen Covey has said, change moves at the speed of trust. We don't have a lot of time, people. So we have to build some trust and we have to build it quickly. And we can do that by working more inclusively and together and by bringing together affected parties. Here at universities, this may be people on our campus, residents in our local community who work at the university, who live around the university, neighbors who are affected by us as an anchor institution, and those communities who are part of our supply chain where we source our food and our goods and our electricity. Building up that inclusive process builds more trust between all of us and leads to better solutions. All right, so this is my other impactful moment. The glass is half full. Half full. So this was a memory around courage to focus on we, what we want, to focus on the glass being half full. After college, I served in AmeriCorps as a volunteer with 39 other young people in Public Allies Chicago under the guidance of Michelle Obama and her team to learn to be a leader to create a just and equitable society. Each 40 of us, 40 young people, had a job during Monday through Thursday, and then on Fridays, we got together for training, group training. My Monday through Thursday job was to serve on environmental and economic development projects, addressing economic development and environmental justice in neighborhoods all across the South Side of Chicago. I thought I was there to solve problems of pollution, trash, poverty. And then Michelle Obama brought in Professor Jody Kretzman from Northwestern for our training on Fridays. And he asked each of us to describe the community where we were working. In my description, I used words like poor, polluted, and desolate. Then he put in front of us a glass of water, partially filled. And he said that this glass represents the community where we might be working. And he said that if we had used words about the community's problems, that we should try again. And instead of describing the community as a glass half empty, that we describe it as a glass half full. So then I thought about it, and it totally shifted my thinking. I used words vibrant, multi-generational relationships, deep culture loving adults, dedicated workers, people thirsty for peace and opportunity, plenty of open space, less than a mile from Lake Michigan, infrastructure connections to parks and schools, community centers, public transportation. Dr. Kretzman and Michelle Obama had made their point with me. When I reflect on that memory, <clears throat> physically, I feel myself taking a quick breath every time. Emotionally, I feel surprised and enlightened. I learned about myself that I had a self-righteousness that, that I would know how to help a community. I learned about the world outside of myself that I was a participant in a structure of white supremacy and inequality in the city of Chicago. Through the course of the year of training, Michelle Obama and her team continued to give us young, budding leaders the opportunity to practice our learnings and share feedback with one another which most often was brutally honest. Some of the best feedback I've ever had in my life. Over the course of my years of work in Chicago, I learned humility, that I did not have the solutions, but rather that I could participate in uplifting the existing assets of the community, 
to see the assets of the community, not as problems, but that my role was to listen, to not fill gaps, but to learn and to advocate, to garner more resources for the community within a larger system that had problems. These lessons of humility, recognizing the value in communities and understanding systemic oppression continue to inform my work today. And from this experience, I believe to courageously focus, focus on the situation we want, inclusive of all perspectives, having the courage to do that is essential to making change for sustainability. So the third requirement that I think is essential for making change for a sustainable world is love. And I'm referring to love as an action, not just a feeling. And this is the perspective that, again, I learned from Bell Hooks. If we express love for one another and for the planet and for our future as an action, then we are going to be in good shape. In this image, you see people taking action, both as individuals and as part of an institution or a system. And when I'm talking about love, I'm talking about love for the planet, love between one another, love for other people, but also love for ourselves and forgiveness for ourselves, and forgiveness for others, for our own personal shortcomings, our own perspectives and imprinting, and for our transgressions that we have had together as part of a system. I also think that we can choose to be inclusive in our approach to creating a better world. I hope that we can find ways to love through action. I believe we each can explore our individual roles in the system and how to change our institutions or as a part of the system of itself, the institution being a part of the system itself. It's not one or the other. It's me and the bigger part that I'm a part of. We need to do our own internal work to determine how we can engage more humbly, more honestly, and listen more, and how we can also claim our power, use our voice, and take individual action. And I'm hoping that we will balance that out with looking at the system and finding ways to improve it. We have created structures bigger than ourselves over history. For example, how do we buy energy as a university? Do we buy green power? How do we eat our food and source our food? Are we sourcing it responsibly and providing the, the remaining food to the right resources? And we also need to individually think about things. So individually, we need to do things like use less electricity and unplug those chargers when we're not using them, and also make change in the system, like institute building energy efficiencies on our campus as an institution of higher education. So let's talk about institutions. I'm currently working at the Georgetown University, and I'm so honored to be in the inaugural role that the university has created. As an anchor institution in Washington, DC, and as a beacon institution in the global community, Georgetown is committed to taking action on sustainability. These are some of the commitments we have made, as I'm sure you all have here. The role of higher education is quite unique in this world. It's to educate, to do research, provide the thought leadership behind that research, and to take action on sustainability here on campus and in our broader communities. At Georgetown, we will be reporting on this progress against these commitments. And we are launching an inclusive sustainability planning process right now to create a vision that leads into implementation. This is a timeline of how Georgetown has begun to take action on environment and sustainability. You can see that the first degree program that the university identifies as related to this area came out in 1992. And the Office of Sustainability, which I am now leading, was created in 2013. The university signed on to the Laudato Si commitment more recently this past year, but Laudato Si came out in 2015. And then there were some, some large um, accomplishments, like completely divesting from fossil fuels, which came to fruition in 2018. Shortly thereafter, there were a few key hires. This was part of Georgetown's plan to get this, get this show on the road and get things moving. In 2019, just before the pandemic hit, Georgetown hired Dr. Pete Mara, who now leads the Earth Commons, which is an institute for environment and sustainability at Georgetown. Dr. Mara is a biologist, a world-renowned ornithologist, and an incredible force for change at Georgetown, and I'm honored to work next to him. Georgetown also brought on Father Gael Giraud, a Jesuit who's working specifically on climate modeling and its impacts on environmental justice at the global scale and the local scale. 
And then I came on board just this academic year. I'm the new kid on the block. I have a lot to learn and a lot of work to do. And I'm really excited to do it. Most recently, in just two months ago, the Earth Commons officially launched. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Earth Commons. It is an interdisciplinary, inclusive institute for environment and sustainability at Georgetown. It addresses the things I mentioned earlier, the key components of the role higher education can have in the world of sustainable development. Education, how many of you here are students taking classes? Duquesne is providing you, hopefully, with education that is going to open your mind and expand your talents to have an impact in the world. How many of you are researchers or thought leaders? There we go. Yes, you are. Claim it. And we are so glad you are here and doing that work because the role of contributing that intellectual contribution is incredibly important in our communities and in our policies around the world. And then the Earth Commons is designed to take action. And that's where the Office of Sustainability comes in. We are working jointly together on all sorts of things, but most notably what we're referring to as living labs. And you likely have some of those here at Duquesne as well. We have lots of ideas around living labs. And we're getting these ideas developed off the ground and of course resourced and funded. So stay tuned and if you know anything about any of these topics, we wanna hear about it so we can learn from your experience. Georgetown has a lot of work to still do. And so I wanna tell you a little bit about the scope of the Office of Sustainability. Our job is to really integrate sustainability into the functions of the administration across the university. And this provides a foundation for the academy, which I see to be perhaps arguably the most impactful part of higher education in sustainability. But we're looking at investment. So working with our partners in the investment office, how do we structure our endowment, our retirement plans, and treasury to contribute to a sustainable world? Procurement, what do we purchase? Is there a circularity frame of mind in our purchasing processes? Are we thinking about plastics and food, embedded carbon, healthy materials? And of course, campus infrastructure. What are we doing with our buildings to make them more energy efficient? It is the least sexy solution to climate change, but is the most impactful solution, is building energy efficiency. You heard it here, folks. It is the best solution. The less energy we use, the less we have to source, the less it costs us, and the less conflict there is around the world on this topic. Also in our infrastructure, we're thinking about water, zero waste, transportation, the list could go on. We're starting to think about our information services. How do we purchase our devices? How do we reuse our devices? How do we power our devices? How are our servers powered? Are they powered by clean energy? And human resources and athletics and student services, these are all the areas where we're thinking about the culture of sustainability. Are we providing benefits to our employees? Are we supporting the mental health of students who are dealing with climate anxiety? Are we thinking about the well-being of students in the future as they move around a campus that is facing hotter days and more extreme weather? And in athletics, we're looking at our fields and our facilities, our concessions, the travel of our athletes, the food they're eating, because oftentimes that is managed separately from the other dining services on campus the apparel they're wearing, and the merchandise that we're all buying. Engagement with our local communities. As anchor institutions, we're looking at how we can collaborate on community-based research, experience, experiential learning, and other ways to bring value to the community through our university. And mission and ministry. Georgetown is really involved with Adato C, the ecological spirituality and lifestyles that accompany that. There are events and retreats, and there's so much more work we need to do there as well. But this all does underpin the academy, where we're creating and supporting and enabling and resourcing future leaders, which are so, so important here. We are embarking on an inclusive strategic planning process right now. So I started this role in September. Um, I hired a team about a month ago. <laughs> And we are now building out our strategic planning process. And we are being very intentional about doing this in an inclusive way. One of the people on my team ran the sustainable DC office for the District of Columbia government and addressed equity and inclusivity in that planning process. We are so fortunate to have him at Georgetown, Dan Gilbo. And I've run inclusive sustainability processes at other places, including GW, Ford Motor Company, Nike, and I've learned from this that inclusivity is absolutely essential. 
So we're launching this process to address these areas, food, climate, materials, nature, water, transportation, equity, and we want to have transparency around this. Our process is gonna be about a year long. So it launched in March, just last month. Launched in February, I lied. Um, launched in February, and it's continuing through this year. So our first round of meetings is about collecting ideas and input, what's worked, what hasn't worked, and we are involving people from all across the university. We will then be drafting something and then providing that back to our community for review, input, and feedback before it is finalized. This is a photograph we took um, a couple weeks ago. And again, with this inclusive process, the whole idea, like I mentioned earlier, is to have the courage to imagine what we want and to do that together. Even when it feels daunting, we can imagine what we want. And if we focus on that, that will get us closer to our desired outcome. It may not turn out exactly how we imagined it, but that's not the point. Things are always perfectly imperfect. The point is that we are headed towards a desired and better future, and we are creating a current better situation. So we are gathering input from stakeholders from all of our disciplines, policy, arts, law, business, science, and health and from a diversity of voices, including indigenous, LGBTQ, people of color, people with special needs, as well as members of our local community and members of communities where we source our goods and services. Since we launched this process just in February, we have had dozens of people eager for change coming to our workshops and meeting with their ideas and thoughtful contributions. So the question here is how do we create a sustainable university, a sustainable world? If you're still awake, you might remember the question I asked you earlier. What is the most impactful moment you experienced making change in the world? As educators, researchers, and change agents, I invite you right now to take a deep breath. Go inward. If you'd like, you could close your eyes or you can keep them open. You can think or you can write your answer. I invite you to do this now with the first thing that comes to mind, and maybe it came to you as I was talking, but what is the most impactful moment you experienced making change in the world? If you could take a moment just to think of that, write it down, have it in mind. Okay, and you'll see I have a second set of questions. You don't need to answer these questions now. You can if they come easily to you, but if you want some time to reflect on it, these are the important questions to answer for your own processing. When you reflect on that memory, how do you feel? What did you learn? What did you learn about yourself and the world around you? And how was inclusivity a part of that moment, of that memory? I encourage you to refer back to this question as your own internal prompt to draw on the truth to courageously create a vision that takes love for all people and the planet into action. It's something that you can come back to. So I'll just end here, which is the case for inclusivity. I think I've made my point that we are all facing irreversible change. Um, we need to face that truth. You are here this tonight and tomorrow during this conference to figure out how to be resilient in the face of this change. And I, I truly believe that we can both survive and thrive in this change if we work in community, inclusive of marginalized, polarized, and other perspectives to rebuild new structures and new systems. This picture, um, I came to this picture by reading again the book, All We Can Save. Sarah Stillman wrote an essay there, and there's wisdom from what she wrote, the wisdom of our sister whales. She wrote, the whole pod arrives at strategies together, turning to their culture, their animal history for clues, and they pick up the slack for one another, sharing food. It's a powerful image of biomimicry, of how we can learn from the creatures around us. You each have a unique role to play making change for a sustainable university and a sustainable world. So I leave you with these questions. 
How can you be inclusive in your approach? Where do you want to take action as an individual and as part of Duquesne? How we face these challenges matters. Thank you. I don't know how we're doing on time. Okay. Big question. Great. Sure. So thank you, Megan. That was wonderful. Very inspiring indeed. Well, we have plenty of time for conversation. So Megan will just uh, take questions as you put your hand up. So when you speak, please stand so that your voice would, pro would project. And we have a microphone uh, floating so that we, your voice can be recorded on uh, our streaming services. Okay, let's have some conversation. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chapel, for your uh, talk. Um, my fatal care, I'm Professor Rudar from the philosophy department. Uh, my fatal character flaw is patience, which is to say I lack a lot of it. So my question is this, being that your talk is about inclusivity with this, um, what I think is an existential problem, and which translates as we need all hands on deck, what are your strategies for talking to people, dialoguing with people, trying to convince people who simply, no matter how much fact-checking you may show them or you know, good arguments that you may make, just simply don't believe that climate change is an issue? Mm, yes, I, I feel you on the patients. I am a similarly wired human being. I think it is... Um, I think we can connect with one another in ways that are not necessarily about climate change. So I have a pretty large family, you know, 23 first cousins. Um, we don't all think the same or see the world the same. And I think what's important in those situations is connecting with people as human beings and supporting one another in ways that we can. So um, one of my cousins, likely wouldn't necessarily think of climate change as a priority, but we do share a love for nature and being outside. So we can bond over that. I also don't believe that we have to have every on, everyone on board to be inclusive. I think we have to have conversations with everyone. But to move forward, we need to find specific levers that will help us shift the system a little bit, as opposed to having everyone shift the lever together. So I hope that makes sense. I think there's a nuance between building trust, maintaining our human connections is really important, regardless of the issue and regardless of people's positions on the issue. But then working towards change in the system in ways that we are empowered to do and also taking into account perspectives that we just may not have thought of. I hope that's helpful. It's a great question. Also, if um, there are not too many questions, if anyone would like to volunteer their most impactful experience. I would love to hear about one or two of those, if you would be interested in sharing, for the extroverts out there. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, I just have one question. So how do you use systems thinking as an approach to tackle sustainability on, uh, on campus and uh, in the local community as well? Mm, thank yeah. you. So um, I'll just give an example. At one of my uh, previous roles, we were looking at how to build out sustainable energy systems and a resilient campus in the community. And, and that inevitably led to how do we connect with the community? So in Washington, DC, one of the biggest challenges we're facing with the impacts of climate change is extreme heat and longer days of extreme heat and longer seasons of extreme heat. And as an anchor institution, we have a lot of buildings that are cooled during the summer. And we are um, thinking about how we source our energy. But I think the real question becomes, well, what does it mean within the broader system? If the power goes out in the grid, 
then the university, just like others in the community, aren't gonna have electricity. So how do we build more resilient communities? We're all in this together, we're all in the same boat, if you will. And so we began a community-engaged research project to look at how we could leverage energy and energy resilience to create more equity. So we were looking at how things were interconnected. We were looking at how the university was connected to the community. We were looking at the resources of the university being an asset in the community, like that glass half full story, and how could the university support the community. So how these things were interconnected helped us figure out our next step. And that led to a research project that then received funding from one of the federal agencies um, to look at how to design infrastructure systems and relationship systems to support communities during times of extreme weather and extreme heat. And um, that's led to some really good results, but if we hadn't looked at the university, if we'd looked at the university in isolation, we wouldn't have gotten to this broader solution. That helps. Go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. I'm very impressed because I've been following through uh, Gaël Giraud uh, the progress you made, you make in uh, Georgetown University. Very, very impressed to have you tonight. <clears throat> um, you were saying that uh, at, the fir at first that we have to kind of uh, sit in the truth when we speak about, uh, and I was surprised that you were saying that uh, uh, we have to work or uh, being uh, uh, resilient as to reduce or uh, not let the temperature, the global temperatures go further than one degree five. And you said also that you are connecting the dots by being somebody who is um, <clears throat> uh, uh, interested in uh, uh, syste the, the system, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, also, if I am not uh, completely wrong, um, what is uh, what what Gail Giraud is about. He came to Georgetown University to try to put all these people who think from their perspective, uh, university, uh, faculty uh, perspective, global warming, and very often we don't uh, connect the dots in order to be uh, conscious of what, uh, aware that, that we are dealing with a system. So I have two questions here. Uh, one is, are you, <laughs> I mean, Gaël Giraud is a specialist of economy, and uh, he has been writing books. He, he's part of uh, what is called uh, non-neoclassical economists, people who are on the margin in the world because they are not agreeing with what the whole world, all the nations, all the, the, all the elites of nations all the universities are teaching, which is based on a book um, of a guy called C.S.A.Y. that has been uh, uh, published in 1828, saying that, uh, <clears throat> to make it short, that we are in a world where we can um, grab the resources of uh, without end, an unlimited world. And as we, as we know, everybody who thinks about uh, 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 resiliency, etc., we are not in an unlimited world. We have to, to uh, be conscious that the world is not limited and we, ca we cannot continue to uh, make a religion of growth being the religious of economy. We have to enter into um, degrowth uh, society. Uh, uh, people who are conscious that degrowth is absolutely necessary in order for the nature to recover and uh, sustain us. And the second part is 
coming I'm coming back to the one degree five uh, we know already and uh, all these people uh, Gaël Giraud and uh, uh, the people who are uh, interested in um, in uh, connecting the dots the the ones who study the system uh, we know that uh, uh, you call that in English the uh, well, the consequence is that we are already fighting for trying to get in 2050 a world that will not go over two degrees. But we know that the one degree five, because of the inertia of the system, uh, one degree five is already uh, reached. Even even if we, if we stop tonight to emit one. A molecular of uh, greenhouse gas. So I would like to know uh, how do you react about that? <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciate the comments and the question. The idea of growth and unlimited growth, I think there are two things I'm going to respond to, the growth and the one degree five. Um, with growth and, and unlimited growth, I think for me, it's less about that economic model, and it's not even, I have a business degree, I, I've worked for corporations, I understand economics. I find those models to be useful in operating in the market economy and in systems where we have to make budgets and where we have to add up tuition dollars and endowment payouts. That's how we manage and make, make our resources work and communicate with one another about how to distribute resources within our institutions. Outside of that, on a more philosophical level, I see um, economics as not being the way I want to interact with the planet. I want to interact with the planet in a relationship where I understand different messages, different signals, different indications of how humans can interact with the planet. There are different ways to eat and grow food than what we're doing now that are more sustainable. There are different ways to use water, to use energy that are more sustainable. So I choose to think about it as a relationship on a more philosophical level. And I think when we're in right relationship with the planet and really listening and understanding that we're more often in right relationship with other people as well who are part of the system to provide us with the resources that we need and vice versa. I try really hard to fix things now instead of throwing them out and buying new things. Um, I have a corner in my house that probably has too much clutter that people keep telling me I should just throw that away. But I'm still looking for ways to solder things or sew things. And that's just one art that I think we've kind of lost touch with and is something that is actually really rewarding and um, is something that can help shift that relationship for me. In terms of um, the work that Gael is doing and the discussions around the 1.5 and the 2 degrees, I deliberately chose the 1.5 to hold on to that as a vision. I don't know that our, my desired outcome will be, but I do believe in holding on to that as a vision. If we end up at 2 degrees, I will not be surprised, um, but I'd like to hold on to a higher, a higher aspiration. Thank you for the questions, really thoughtful. Thank you. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times your work with corporations. So I'd like to know what were some of the big lessons learned mm -hmm. for you when working in that environment versus your other environments? In terms of working in the corporate sector, um, my theory of change when I went to business school, what, I had two theories of change. One was, let's create change through the startups. And at that time, I worked with Honest Tea, which is now owned by Coke. And there was a line of tea around as a mint tea. And it was based on the Crow Indian tribe mint tea recipe. Um, that line is no longer available. But I worked with Seth Goldman, the CEO at the, the TEO at the time, uh, on a team, a volunteer team, to help with that project and help to source the mint tea. And I thought of that as a way to make change, you know, in the market, as an innovation, as a disruption. 
And then I also worked with large corporations with brands like Ford and Walmart and Nike and saw those corporations as a way to make change in a system that they likely had more influence over global markets than countries did. And so if I could be a part of their efforts to be more sustainable as a company, that that would be a theory of change. And I think what I learned from both of those theories of change is that the work is never done. And in the corporate sector, um, the corporate sector was really the first sector to take a step in this direction around organizational change. And then the, the world of Peter Senge and the Society of Organizational Learning merged that with sustainability. So I learned so much from that sector that I could then take to higher education and, and to other work that I've been doing. Um, I, don't, I don't think there are limits to what the corporate sector can do. I do think it really matters on how they are governed. I think public policy and governance and democratic governance are really important to keep our corporate activity in line with where we as people want things to go. And the more inclusive that determination is, um, I think the more sustainable the solution will be there. Does that answer the question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for coming sure. and speaking with us. I'm really interested in hearing more about the Office of Sustainability and the Earth Commons, but for the time being, for the present moment, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the advantages and disadvantages of doing this work in an urban location where there are multiple anchor institutions. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to hear a little bit more about that from your perspective at Georgetown. I don't think there's many disadvantages. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess the disadvantages are that in a uh, urban area with multiple anchor institutions, there's a lot of anchor institutions. <laughs> and so um, having control is not the situation. I think, you know, in Washington, D.C., we have a coalition of universities. There are 11 universities in the district, and we've all worked together on everything from legislation to making internal commitments to student exchange programs. We just hosted um, the climate teach-in. I don't know if you all were a part of that last week, the national climate teach-in, but all the universities banded together. So students from Howard and Georgetown and GW and Catholic were all traveling to each other's campuses. Um, and I do see students from each university sharing best practices and experiences on how you plant an urban garden, on how you divest from fossil fuels or get your university to divest from fossil fuels. So there are a lot of benefits. And I, I don't think the downside is at all as, as big as the, as the upside for collaboration and the power of finding a unified interest. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation today. I just had a question um, regarding, like, transformation in the higher education system. So obviously there's, you know, a large disparity between the size of endowments across universities, especially public and private. So when it, when it comes to things like you mentioned infrastructure change as part of the climate change action, uh, when it comes to making those investments in redefining the infrastructure, how do you see you know lesser endowed universities, especially public universities in state school systems, for example, um, being able to make the necessary investments so that they're not left behind because they don't have the ability to allocate to make that sort of change? Great question. The challenge around making these investments is that they're long term, but the upside of making these investments is that universities are usually long term institutions. And so when we can align the vision, the long term vision of an institution as a university or, or a college, if we can align that with the long term benefit of the payback of investing in, in buildings and energy efficiency, then that alignment can get you there. When we're looking at you know, meeting a certain target within two to three years, that can be a little more challenging. I have seen different mechanisms work. If we're talking around, let's just talk about building renovations for energy and water. If I've seen different models work where universities have taken out you know, money against themselves, own internal funds, to create a fund to invest in those retrofits in the buildings and to track those paybacks internally and to pay that fund back to invest in for future retrofits. And the trick there is to make sure that you have a diverse portfolio of projects that have a short-term and a long-term payback so that you don't 
so that you can support those longer term. So for example, a short term payback would be changing out all the LED, all the lights to LEDs. That'll pay back in a couple of years at the most. But if you're gonna replace a chiller to become a more modern chiller that's more efficient, which is gonna get you much more energy savings, that's a significant capital investment. So you wanna blend both the short term and the long term so that those LED lights start to pay back for that chiller that's not gonna pay back in a long time. So I've seen models where universities have created their own internal fund and borrowed against their own internal money. Um, and I've also seen models where universities have partnered with corporations and corporations have put up the money, sort of like an ESCO. At Georgetown, we have a really unique partnership with NG, which is a French company, and where NG is actually at the, at the moment owning our infrastructure and is responsible for meeting certain efficiencies and paying the university back for that. So there are different creative ways to do this, which is why I'm such a huge fan of students getting science training, business training, and policy training, because to come to these solutions, it's great to know some of the tools, the finance tools. It's great to know how this can inform public policy, and it's really, it's always easier once you know the science behind it, because you can understand what, what we're talking about. But um, yeah, mirroring the long-term with the long-term, and then having a mix of short-term and long-term projects is important. Thank you. Is there anyone who wants to share their impactful moment? Indulge me, please. So um, in high school, I was involved in this youth group and every spring we put on a musical and we had free admission for this musical. Um, and then all of our like funds that we got in donations went towards um, our like mission project in Appalachia, Kentucky. Um, and then I actually got to go down there for a summer and like not a whole summer, just a week in the summer and like see what the impact of like our donations made on those families and like how we could help them out. And it was just like that was like very impactful for me to see. What do you think um, what do you think you're going to carry with you into the future from that? Oh, my gosh. Well, I'm going back every year for sure. <laughs> um, but just like. In your role as a change agent, what do you think that's gonna? Just like seeing how much of an impact you can really have on people when you like put in effort. Great, thank you. Hold on to that. <laughs> All right, Jerry, where are you? Oh, there you are. What do you think? Is it a wrap? Are there any more questions or comments? Good. Well, thank you very much. Wow, what a start to our conference this year. Thanks a lot, Megan. That was truly inspiring, uh, very moving, and uh, utterly imaginative. It's by captivating our creativity that we are able to have courage to go forward with the love that you mentioned for the planet. Uh, it's quite a remarkable story, quite a remarkable message. We're going to have a social now next door, so please join us and talk with Megan privately. Uh, share your little story of impact. I'm sure uh, Megan will be interested among ourselves, truly indeed. I hope you come back tomorrow. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do tomorrow. Uh, at the front of the conference, we have our plenary speaker, and at the end of the conference, we have our second uh, plenary speaker. But the work during the day tomorrow is, our, is dedicated to our, our sessions, pulling classes together. These classes have been working all semester, preparing for the conference. They have submitted their posters. Many of you are in these classes, and uh, many of those posters are then going to be presented on the podium here, uh, students talking to students. It's so important because, as Megan said, we have to take action. Our vision has got to lead to practice. And there's no better practice in the academy than you students using your research, using your own imagination and your courage to speak truth in love to save our planet. See you all tomorrow. Thank you.